The UK held an election on Thursday, but it wasn't a regular election. It was a snap election to sort of say, okay, for real though, Brexit, for real this time. If you've heard anything about the results, you know that it was fairly controversial and anything but a landslide. After a few requests on Friday, I put my video topic for this week up for a vote on Twitter. That's why you should follow me on there. As you can see, UK politics got 43%, so just like the Tories, it wins. Wait, what? Not all democracies work the same way, and here in America we have a number of misconceptions about other democracies in the world, particularly when it comes to the United Kingdom. Because of that, in an effort to explain how the British government works, I'm going to relate it to how the US government works. So while this video is supposed to explain how the UK works to non-Brits, I suppose any Brits who are watching could reverse engineer what I'm about to say to learn about the US. So yeah, two for one. First, we need to get some structure and vocabulary out of the way. The United Kingdom is a country in the British Isles. Some of you may know this, but the official name of the UK is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Where is Great Britain? This is Great Britain, the largest island in the British Isles. And on Great Britain, there are three countries. England, Scotland, and Wales. So the United Kingdom is a country that's made up of four countries, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. If it helps, you can think of these four countries like states. They each have their own government and parliament, which capitulate to the overall United Kingdom government, just like how states fall under the federal government. The term British refers to all of them, and while you can call all of the people British, some of them might take offense to that. The first misconception, the queen is just a figurehead. This is something that Americans like to say because it's something they've heard over and over in the media or in school, perhaps as a way to delegitimize the idea that the United Kingdom Kingdom is still a monarchy. But it's simply not true. Here in America we have a president. This president has many roles, like head of government, head of state, chief executive, and commander in chief. These are all very different jobs all lumped into one person. But in the UK they have two people, the prime minister or PM who is the head of government and chief executive, and the monarch who is the head of state and the commander in chief. Since here in America one person does all of these things, we don't really pay that much attention to the differences and may not even realize that they exist, so let's break them down a bit. The head of state is the leader of the people, not necessarily the government. In the United Kingdom, the government serves in Her Majesty's name and by her permission, but I'll get to that later. In America, most of the background responsibilities of the head of state are performed by the Secretary of State, but in the United Kingdom, all of these responsibilities fall on the Queen. She appoints all of the ambassadors to other countries. In fact, the British ambassador to the United States is not the British ambassador. He is a representative of the Crown, not the government, and is therefore Her Majesty's ambassador to the United States of America. And the United States does not have an ambassador to the UK. It's the ambassador of the United States to the Court of St. James, which is the royal court of the Queen. In practice, they are obviously ambassadors to and from the government, but in reality, they are to and from the crown, separate from the government. Quick side note, the crown is the position, the queen is the person. The queen is also commander-in-chief of the military. In the United States, when you join the military, you're swearing to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States, which says that you'll obey the lawful orders of the president. But in the United Kingdom and some of the Commonwealth nations, you're swearing allegiance to the crown. Not the Constitution, not your government, and not your country. All of the ships in the Royal Navy are HMS for Her Majesty's ship. Now in practice, the government, through the Ministry of Defense, spelled with a C, runs the day-to-day -day operations of the military. But in the end, she is the commander-in-chief, and she has the power to declare war, not parliament. It's the reverse in the US. The president runs day-to-day -day operations, and Congress declares war. The queen has a number of other functions that don't come with a nice neat label. Like the president, she appoints judges, in England and Wales anyway. The court system there is royal. Until 2005, the House of Lords, which I'll get to later, acted as the Supreme Court. Now there's a separate body, but it's still appointed by the crown. The queen is also the head of the church. Since we have a secular government and we don't have a state religion, we don't really have an equivalent to that here in the US. So if it helps, you can think of her as the Anglican Pope. And like the president, she has final veto power or royal assent on all acts of parliament, which then makes them law. 
The Crown has not exercised its veto power in over 300 years, but still, it is there, so it is still possible. Just to make things more complicated, the Crown is also the head of state for many of the Commonwealth nations, like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, which is why she's on all the money there. She has less power over there, but power nonetheless. So now let's talk about the Prime Minister, who is the head of government and the chief executive. This means that that person is the actual leader of the government and runs its day-to-day -day operations. The cabinet is chosen by the Prime Minister, and they mostly run government departments, much like the cabinet in the US. In the US, we have a Secretary of State, a Secretary of Defense, and 20 others. Not all of them are heads of government departments. In the UK, they have a Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, a Secretary of State for Defense, and again, strangely enough, 20 others. These names are usually shortened to Foreign Secretary and Defense Secretary, again spelled with a C. Unlike in the US, the UK cabinet does not require approval from Congress or the Parliament. So how is the Prime Minister chosen? This is what the election on Thursday was about, but the people don't directly vote for Prime Minister. We don't directly vote for President either, but that's complicated and... There are dozens of videos out there on the Electoral College, and for those of you who follow my channel regularly, you know I have a pretty strict no beating dead horses policy when it comes to my content, so... Go watch some of those. So again, how is the Prime Minister chosen? The United Kingdom has two Houses of Parliament, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The House of Lords is the upper house and consists of 800 appointees by the Queen. Yet another way how she still has significant power. The House of Lords is actually the shortened name. The real name is The Right Honourable, the Lords Spiritual and Temporal of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland in Parliament Assembled. They're the bishops of the church who are the Lords Spiritual, and the hereditary Lords, Dukes, Barons, and Counts who are the Lords Temporal. All Acts of Parliament go through them before they go to the Queen. They can scrutinize and amend the Acts, but they can't prevent them from becoming law. So if you want to talk about who the figurehead is, the House of Commons is the elected lower house. You can kind of think of it like the US House of Representatives. The United Kingdom is divided up into 650 constituencies. You can kind of think of this like the 435 congressional districts, although those are way larger. You have to remember that the UK is the size of Oregon, with the populations of California and Texas crammed in. Typically, a constituency represents around 70,000 people, whereas in the US it can vary widely because of how we apportion them by state. With the lowest being 526,000 in Rhode Island, and the highest being 994,000 in Montana, with the average still being about 10 times as many people. Anyway, each of these constituencies is represented by a Member of Parliament, or MP, and this is what the people are voting for. They don't directly vote for Prime Minister. Each constituency is a race for local representation and for national government. Each Member of Parliament is chosen by a simple majority, which just means whoever got the most votes, which means there are some constituencies represented by an MP who only got 24% of the vote, but they were still the highest voted candidate. And that can only happen because the UK is a multi-party system, unlike the US with our two-party system. They still only have two main ones, but in the election on Thursday, nine parties won seats. The United States has 538 electoral votes for president, so someone must get 270 votes in order to win. The United Kingdom has 650 constituencies, so a party must get 326 in order to win. I said party there, because again, people are not directly voting for Prime Minister. They vote for their MP, who represents a party. The party that gets the most MPs chooses their Prime Minister. You usually know who that's going to be before the vote, but there is no primary. It's selected by the party. But what happens when no party gets the required 326, which is what happened on Thursday? They can form a coalition government. The Conservatives, also known as the Tories, won 318 seats. The Labour Party, spelled with a U, won 262. These are the two main parties, and you can kind of think of them as Republicans and Democrats, and they hold similar views to their US counterparts. The next biggest party is the Scottish National Party with 35 seats, and as you may have guessed, they only ever win in Scotland, and ever since the vote for Brexit, they've been pushing for independence. Then at 12 seats are the Liberal Democrats, who formed a coalition government with the Tories in 2010. And then the Democratic Unionist Party with 10 seats are the ultra-right-wing party. If it helps, you can think of them like the Tea Party. And then there are four other smaller parties, which I'm not going to talk about because... 
come on, the screen is already pretty full. So the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats formed a coalition government in the past, which just means that the two parties got together in order to cross the 326 threshold. They elect the main candidate's party for prime minister and usually share some cabinet positions. So why didn't they form a coalition this time? Because of Brexit. The Liberal Democrats are very much against Brexit, while the Conservatives are now apparently for it? I say that with some uncertainty because the Conservatives weren't always for it. In the last general election in 2015, in order to sway UKIP voters, the Tories promised to have a referendum on whether or not the UK should leave the EU, or the British exit, or Brexit. That quasi-unstated coalition helped them win. The Tories didn't really think that the people would go for it, but in 2016 they did, so David Cameron resigned. Since then, there's been a lot of turmoil and media coverage over whether the people honestly really knew what it was that they were voting for, so the new PM, Theresa May, called for a snap election. As I said in the beginning, this was more or less a revote on Brexit without calling it that in order to save face. So now that we're caught up, back to the election results on Thursday. The Conservatives didn't get the 300 126 majority, so in order to at least make the process easier, they have to form a coalition government with one of the other parties. Labour is against Brexit, the Scottish National Party is against it, and the Liberal Democrats are against it, but the DUP is for it. And that's who they're going to form a coalition with, which will put them at 328 seats. And that's why I also didn't mention the smaller parties, because while they could form a coalition with the Green Party in their one seat, that really wouldn't make that much of a difference. The coalition with the DUP is controversial because of their super right-wing stance on the issues, like being against abortion, gay marriage, and other LGBT rights. But when it comes to UK independence from the EU, there you go. Could the Labour Party have formed a coalition to get to the required 326? In theory, yes, but it would have had to include the DUP and at least three other parties. So, no. So the Prime Minister is chosen from whichever party has the majority in the House of Commons, and then they go to the Queen in order to ask for permission to form a government. They could, in theory, do away with everything that's already established and form an entirely new government, which would be chaos and they'd likely lose in a vote of no confidence, which is like impeachment but way easier so they don't. But then they fill the cabinet in order to lead the various ministries, and because of that, the UK government is referred to as a single party government. Unlike in the US where the president can be from one party and the houses of congress can be from another. Everything from the prime minister on down all belong to one party. The second largest party in the house of commons is then known as the opposition, and their leader is known as the leader of the opposition. That person doesn't really have any power outside of the one-on-one -on -one debate they have with the Prime Minister in sessions of Parliament. So the next time you hear the American media say that Theresa May was re-elected, or you hear that the Queen is just a figurehead or a tourist attraction, hopefully now you'll know better. My one year anniversary is next week and I'm almost to a thousand subscribers, so stay tuned for a special video soon. But if you enjoyed that video or you learned something, make sure to give that like button a click. If you'd like to see more from me, I put out new videos every Sunday, so make sure to like that subscribe button. Also make sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter and join the conversation on the Reddit so you can have some input on my future videos. But in the meantime, if you'd like to watch one of my older videos, how about this one?